really assess root causes of conflict? How do you, as regular citizens, make up your minds about your reaction to such events? Well, there are some changes happening that bring us great hope, great reason for hope. At the international stage, international law has recently come up with a new concept. It's been coined the responsibility to protect doctrine. And it simply says, look, we are all connected. We can no longer abide by the old wisdom about sovereignty, that one nation should not interfere in the internal affairs of another. That norm is out of date. If a nation as a state is not upholding its own obligations to protect its citizens, then the international community must and should respond. So the responsibility to protect doctrine gives legal and ethical justification for outside coalitions to intervene in a sovereign state's affairs when it's no longer protecting its own people. This concept is relatively new. It was established in 2001, uh, and it's recently taken up at the World Summit in 2005 and adopted by the UN in 2006. But it remains to be seen exactly what R2P can do to promote peace, reduce conflict, and bring about reconciliation in our world. Who are going to be the outside groups intervening? Will it be one country like the United States? Should it be a coalition, an international community? Could it be international NGOs? Who has the right to intervene and on whose behalf? So this is something that's happening at a very high level among states in dialogue, but it has ramifications for us because right now at this very moment, we can look at the map and we can see the places that are affected whether it be Darfur or Zimbabwe, whether it be countries like Burma, whether it be not a country per se, but a condition like HIV. Who has a responsibility to protect those who can't protect themselves? Do we? And if we do, as individuals, what can we do? We're not states. We don't have negotiating power at the table at the UN Security Council. What's our responsibility? Well, we know some of the ways because we've been faced with them time and time again. You can donate. Americans are blessed to have more resources than most people. You can become an activist and get involved. You can use the skills you have, whether you're an interviewer, whether you can write, whether you have internet capabilities, whether you are a very good person at persuading and selling a concept. You can find your passion and use your skills to get involved in some way. We're all busy. Maybe sometimes you have an hour. Maybe sometimes you have a day. If, but if we all do what we can, where we can, then we can start to see change. But I want to talk about a third way that is not often discussed. And this third way to affect change and promote peace is something that we can see as individuals and we can see at the international level. When I was, had the opportunity to serve uh, as a US delegate to the UN, it was in the Geneva UN building. And it has a special place called the Serpentine Lounge. And the Serpentine Lounge is this gorgeous 1960s era um, coffee shop, if you will, that is in the shape of an S. And when you walk in, you will see people from every possible corner of the planet looking every possible different way. Different outfits, different colors, different shapes, different sizes. But they're all diplomats representing their nations with pride and engaging in constructive and problem-solving dialogue with each other. And there are literally, at any given day at the UN, over 100 different forms of these folks working together, trying to solve problems across borders. So at once, it's very international, it's state to state, but there's something about each individual there that they bring. We've seen when organizations and countries have good leaders, great things can happen. And when these individuals 
have unfortunate affects or are not in a good position to lead, bad things can happen. So the individual does matter, even at the state level. For me, it was something that I didn't quite realize until I had to see it from my own eyes. The power of the individual. And I was blessed to be told this following story by a colleague of mine who's a mediator. And he was asked to come to West Africa to help settle a longstanding tribal dispute. So you had one group of people who had been the dominant force in the region. They controlled most of the land, most of the resources. And you had the underdog, a younger group of folks with poor leadership who kept coming in and using guerrilla tactics to take resources away. So the mediator was an American. He came in. He met with the parties that had in advance, and then he arranged for them to all show up one day at one location for the mediation. He brought them into the room, and all of a sudden, the chief of the first dominant tribe stood up. And he was very angry, and he stomped his foot and he said to them, how dare you, how dare you, mediator, bring me here to talk with these people and they don't even have someone at my level worthy of hearing me. How dare you? The mediator stepped back and he thought, uh-oh, this is it. I must have blown it. What should I do now? And the room was silent. One minute. Two minutes went by. But this is the beauty of mediation. It doesn't matter who the mediator is sometimes. Because the process itself of bringing people together with the aim of solving problems has unique and unexpected ways of working. So here, the leader of the other tribe, who was a 20-something year old young man, walked over to the chief, bent down, and kneeled. And he said, oh, great chief, you are so right. Be it is precisely because we have no one at your status, because we have no great chief, no leader, that we have this problem. You see, we lost all of our leaders to the great war. We have no one to guide us and to provide wisdom. This is why we're disorganized. This is why we're stealing your resources. Great chief, please help us. And then the chief looked down, and he put his hand under the chin and raised the guy's face. And he looked in his eyes, and he said, no, it is you who are the great one. For you have helped me realize the power of forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me. And that was the mediation. The mediator had very little to do with it. And in this example, it's such a powerful story when I heard it, because it's the example that each one of us has to, in our own way, promote peace. How do we do this? Well, first, we must remember that we are indeed connected. But second, we must remember that there are something about the energy of a peaceful person that can make a greater difference. And we have many examples. I raise a few. There's a UCLA student, former student, who's now graduated. His name is Adam Sterling. When he was at UCLA, he took up the cause of Darfur. He couldn't understand why governments weren't moving more quickly. He couldn't understand why people would care, but that was it. And he was dedicated to doing something. I think we can all relate because we have those moments where we read the news or we see something that's happening and we think, gosh, I should do something, but what should I do? 